recording and I'm going to hand over um, to Graham. Okay, thanks Jennifer. Uh, welcome everybody, thanks for your time. I'm uh, just going to briefly introduce myself. My name's uh, Graham Jones. I work at the college. I've been in the prison service for five years. Prior to that, uh, I spent 20 odd years in the military. Uh, I'll cover a bit more about how I ended up in uh, the job I'm in later, but my current role is I run um, the central recruitment and resourcing team that's responsible for operations officers and residential officer recruitment. So our direct external entrance into the operational roles within the jail. I've got a presentation of about 15 or 20 minutes just to cover, to try and highlight all the different okay, opportunities okay. that are available um, across the prison service and the variety of things that go on. Um, and, oh, I think we've got a couple that aren't on mute. Could you all just uh, check you're on mute, please? Thanks. Um, that's great. And, and then what we'll do is I brought a couple of my colleagues along, Sam and Anna and myself. And the main reason for that is none of us have had standard entries and careers into the prison service where we are. So we'll give you a couple of minute background of how we've ended up where we've got to um, as, a, as a highlight of the variety of options for routes in and opportunities that are within the prison service. So I'll just crack on with uh, the presentation initially. It is a PowerPoint slick side show, I'm afraid. Um, but there we go, oh, right. and it's not at the start. Poor presentation technique by me. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is look at um, who works for the prison service and how we all got here. Um, I'm going to look at where we are, um, our link to our mission and vision, what we're all about, an overview of the operational and non-operational roles uh, that are available. I think you'll all be surprised at how many different job opportunities there are within the Scottish Prison Service. Uh, to highlight that, I'll look at some of the recent recruitment campaigns that have been run uh, at the moment uh, across the various establishments and again centrally. I'll then focus on our operational careers, um, what you would ordinarily think of as a, a prison officer, the three different roles uh, and the routes in and cover our assessment and selection processes. Uh, look on uh, current and future strategic developments that are really important, the developments that are going on across the, in particular, the women's and the youth estates. Uh, and then, as I said, uh, personal stories for the three of us. And then with loads of times for questions um, for anything that you want to ask. So just to crack on, where are we? Uh, this map shows all the uh, prison establishments across Scotland. You'll see we're mostly clustered in the central belt. There are, there are a few outliers up north in Inverness, northeast in Peterhead, across to the west in Greenock and down in Dumfries, uh, with our headquarters in uh, Edinburgh. The two jails at uh, Adiwell and Kilmarnock don't belong to the Scottish Prison Service. They are privately run jails, but there are again some uh, of our staff position there for contract monitoring. So those are the places of most of the opportunities for employment within the Scottish Prison Service. Our estate is really varied. Uh, we've got some nice new jails uh, like Low Moss that are new purpose built over the last 10 or 15 years um, with the facilities you'd expect. You see here some pictures uh, of some of the, the newer single accommodation uh, with all the en suite in the newer jails. But then a lot of the estate is still old. We've still got Barlini, uh, old Victorian jails um, that look like things that you'll have seen on TV programmes. Uh, across the years uh, with the old fashioned cells. The good news is uh, most of the estate is programmed to be upgraded, but that depends on um, government funding, particularly on, on the capital expenditure. So uh, we'll have a look that uh, Corton Vale, the women's estate, is currently in the middle of a rebuild. Balini is due to be rebuilt uh, as HMP Glasgow, and then Inverness, our other really old jail, is highlighted to be rebuilt, but again, not in the next five years, at least, I would think. So what are we about? Well, on the tin, it says uh, the mission is helping build a safer Scotland, unlocking potential transforming lives. To do that, okay, the Scottish Prison Service's overriding aim is to provide services that help to transform people in our care that can fulfill potential and become responsible citizens. The key aspect of this, and a lot of what we've done recently, is change our recruitment principles to values-based principles because um, 
every single job, every role within the Scottish Prison Service is aimed and designed at fulfilling that vision and mission. Uh, I like to think of it as the old adage uh, of the guy in NASA who was sweeping the floor and asked what his job was. He was he reported to reply, his job was to put um, a man on the moon. So everybody within the organization is aligned with that overriding purpose of looking after the people in our care to fulfill their potential and become responsible citizens. Uh, and because of that, we have shifted our recruitment along a values-based um, process rather than a competency base, which I'll cover a bit more moving on. Jobs available. Well, on the screen is just some of them. Uh, you'll be surprised at the various uh, roles that we have. Uh, we have our own chaplains. We have our own uh, learning and development managers, HR, finance, IT, uh, and prison officers. The main recruitment processes centrally uh, run within the college is my team do all the prison officers uh, and then there's another team that do um, the estates management so we've got all our own engineering trades and managers uh, and any corporate stuff but each jail also has its own HR team so they do their own recruitment for local jobs uh, so administration uh, finance um, HR, all those sort of things are all done locally as well. So there's central recruitment, but all the different establishments, the 13 jails run their own recruitments and have their own um, assessment processes as well. Uh, if you ever go onto our career website, you'll see a full variety of jobs uh, that are available at the moment. It changes from, from week to week. Just to highlight some of the stuff that we've recruited for, and that is within the last six months centrally, um, you can see it's everything from quantity to surveyors, uh, network specialists, learning and development managers to work in the college, psychologists, finance, policy improvements, and in fact, our head of college um, job opportunities up at the moment that actually closed at lunchtime today. So we've got an external advert for somebody to come in to run the college responsible for all the training and development across the organization. So that should show you that there's a huge uh, variety of jobs and opportunities um, within the organization. And we are admittedly not very good as uh, uh, an organization for selling ourselves as an employer of things other than uh, prison officers and the operational side. So this is something that we're, we're really trying to get out, out and about across um, the variety of engagement uh, opportunities. Um, Focusing briefly then on, on the actual prison officer, the one that most people would associate with us, um, covering the, the different roles and the entry processes and some of the stuff that shifted. So we've got operations officers, residential officers, and then we've got new management um, programs. The ops officer is the base level entry point, and for a long time it was the only entry point into the operational side. Ops officers, they're part of the busy team, um, larger number. They are responsible for the day-to-day -day safety and maintenance uh, within the jail. So they man um, the front of house. So if you ever go to a, a visit a jail, they're the people that are running the front desk. They do the patrols, they escort prisoners around, um, and they run the electronic control room. But a couple of the really important roles that they do is they monitor all the visits. Uh, and they man the reception. And reception is not what you think of as by um, a hotel, which is what I originally thought that reception was the, was the front desk when you walk in. Reception is the part of the jail where all people in custody come in and out of the jail. So it could be the first time somebody's been entered a jail straight up from court, their first visit or a thousandth visitor or their liberation. So that sort of interaction with the people coming in and out of our care uh, is really, really important and what one of the key roles that an ops officer would do. The current assessment process for uh, ops officers is an online application. We've recently introduced an online situational judgment test. I'm going to come back and explain a little bit more about that in a minute. You then progress to an online cognitive ability test or psychometrics, uh, as most people would refer to them as, on uh, numerical and verbal reasoning. We removed any academic requirements to entry to try and help diversity uh, to encourage people with a less formal academic background but the right skill set to join. So that's been replaced by an online cognitive ability test. And then uh, an interview, which again shifted to an online platform uh, 
a year ago uh, once COVID started and we will be continuing that once the restrictions lift because it's been exceptionally successful. Situational judgment tool, this uh, is one of the slides from that. This was designed specifically between our recruitment team, our operational director and occupational uh, psychologists. Online, uh, individuals are given uh, scenarios such as this one and then asked to be what were their most and least favorite um, option to take. And there's 20 scenarios from a bank of 90 that people go through. And the idea is that we are starting to filter out people whose values and judgment are not aligned with the principles that we're looking for. So that's uh, a new test that was introduced in the last 12 months and has been extremely successful. The other main role is the residential officer. Um, they can take many different roles, but they're the ones that have more of the regular day-to-day -day interaction with the prisoners. Um, they're predominantly based within the accommodation areas, but can take a variety of roles, as you can see in this next picture. So uh, residential officers can work in the gym. They run some of the work sheds or the uh, skill development sessions that we do. Uh, they run the programs for be uh, offending behavior programs that are overseen by the psychologists and they just look after the residential areas. So they have day-to-day -day regular interaction with the prisoners. And this is the, the value set that we're looking for to have the interactions and the role modeling behavior that can have the positive impact on the behavior of people that are um, in jail. The assessment process for this is different. Uh, and this has been recently amended Historically, you had to become an ops officer before you then progressed to be a residential officer. There was time served, required a, an internal promotion. 12 months ago, uh, we shifted this. We looked for direct entrant residential candidates um, to bolster the pool and look for people on a career change with transferable skills and the values that we're looking for, for that key role of the day-to-day -day interaction, role modeling and positive impact uh, on people in our care. So the assessment process for this is different. The initial stage is the same, application, situational judgment test, and cognitive ability test. We then run uh, group and written exercises. Uh, people are required to come to the college and we record group exercises and undergo written exercises. I'll cover the content of what we're looking for in that point in a minute. And then we have a values-based interview. We spent an awful lot of time in research developing values-based approaches rather than competency-based to try and uh, recruit people whose values are aligned with those of the organization um, with the aim of bringing in the right people. This approach has been used by the NHS for a long time. We used a lot of their um, ideas and research. And the overriding principle is that um, if you the beliefs and values that we all hold and that we've been brought up with have a massive impact on our attitudes and behaviors. And it's these attitudes and behaviors that are key um, to the roles that we require people to fill within the, the operational aspect of the Scottish Prison Service. So the underlying principles really is if we recruit people whose values aligned to the organization, then we get the right attitudes. Um, so it's a matter of learning how we measure those approach and attitudes uh, within the interview uh, and assessment process. Values-based interviews are far more focused on the how and why uh, applicants make their choices at work. The examples that we look for, we then dig into the how and why and what they've learned from doing it. So the principle is that we recruit for values and then we can train for the skills that we need people to have. So the group and written exercise, the group exercise is uh, conducted in a room. There's four people um, and basically it's a, a scenario very similar to a lot of group exercises. You'll see uh, if you Google, we'll look them up. They're survival type ones. Who would you choose to say first or last? Um, and the competencies we're measuring in there are relationship building, decision making and communication skills. So within that 35 minutes, the exercise is recorded. Uh, and then it's assessed subsequently by trained assessors to see if people have got the skill set. Uh, and it's about listening, communicating effectively, being able to acknowledge other people's points of view, and build those effective relationships to influence other people through your positive communication over a period of 35 to 40 minutes. The other aspect we're looking for is decision making. One of the key skills 
that uh, everybody within the Scottish Prison Service requires is defensible decision making. All decisions that that we make need to be defensible, and there are legal definitions about uh, following uh, a decision if there is. Um, an unfortunate or unforeseen circumstance, with hindsight, would that decision uh, withstand scrutiny? And it's that sort of decision making, considering all the options, factors, uh, implications, and the broader picture that is the skill set that we're looking for in that group exercise. Straight after that group exercise, they go uh, and undertake a written exercise um, where they have to give an account of the exercise itself. Um, plus a reflective element of what they learnt um, throughout the exercise. The point being, we're looking for two skills, being able to report accurately and write effectively, um, but also the evidence of people being able to reflect on their own um, interactions, their own behaviours, and learn from the um, experience. Because one of the key roles of becoming a residential officer without the operation officer background is the requirement to learn day to day. We're introducing reflective practice, personal development, professional development throughout your career uh, and ongoing support to do that. So it's a key element that we're looking for. Onto the interview, the differences between the interview competency areas. Ops officer is still more competency based than values based. Um, looking for an ability to evidence some professional development, teamwork, following process and procedures, influencing others, and basic problem solving. Whereas the residential officer, whilst it's similar commitment to professional development, we start digging far more into the impact. How have you used your learning? What positive impact has it had? And what results have you, you had? Um, digging into examples about supporting others uh, and making it a difference having a positive impact on other people, but also the ability to challenge inappropriate behavior effectively um, and have a positive impact that way. And the resilience, certainly the resilience alongside that not having immediate success um, and continuing making small differences day to day heading towards the overall um, outcomes that we're looking for. So those, and it's the questions are much more about where have you had an impact? How did you do it? What problems did you face? Who did you consult with? All those sort of things. So we're really digging into the how and why people have persevered um, to try and make a positive impact and a, and a difference and hoping to get individuals with the values and the skill set um, that will make them effective residential officers in the jail environment. The final route in is, uh, over the years, the predominant route for promotion is internal. We like to grow our own. We like to grow uh, internal management through the through the system. There is uh, certainly an opportunity for anybody to come in as an ops officer to end up as a governor in charge or even a chief executive of the organization. However, um, to improve diversity, quality, and we've always struggled to um, grow sufficient internally. Over the years, we've had a variety of external routes into the management system. Uh, Sam, who's going to speak to you in a minute, uh, was on one of the, the last ones. Um, the new process is about to be rolled out. It actually uh, comes into fruition at the end of April. The next um, application process is coming in. The details of which have yet to be published, but we're looking for people with transferable operational skills. Um, from other areas, um, from other similar industries, not necessarily from um, a justice background. Uh, and then on the back of that will be a specific talent program, talent identification and development for our senior managers. So this is a new uh, initiative that's being started this year. Again, a lot of it is values driven, looking for the people with the right behaviors and the right values alongside um, decision making and the correct uh, and a variety of operational experience so we're really looking for um, transferable skills and a willingness to bring that across to the Scottish prison service so the, in, in the sort of key bit of the skills and knowledge that, that we're looking for it is um, communication skills empathy values resilience all those sort of key elements, uh, willingness to cha challenge, moral courage, physical courage, uh, are some of the key aspects of the role that, that we're looking for 
um, within our people. And then through development uh, and promotion, we're looking for, we're shifting to values-based leadership. So we're looking for, we're not looking for old school dictatorial type sort of leadership in promotion. We're really looking for um, managers who can grow their own staff, who uh, whose behaviors are aligned with the values of the organization. Um, but at the same time can manage and deal with operational incidents in a high stress environment. So it's that flexibility of leadership style and management that, that we're looking for as we're growing and developing our senior managers of the future. Training elements, uh, again, just a quick overview, the Ops Foundation Programme. So if you come as an Ops Officer, it's six weeks residential at the college, uh, covering a variety of things, um, control and restraint, a lot of the practical stuff, searching and escorting, but also things like equality and diversity. Um, opportunities, we're recruiting heavily throughout this year on the operations side. So there's a course of 42 new recruits start every six to eight weeks throughout this year. So that's the main volume of our recruitment process for this year. The residential side, uh, the Residential Officer Foundation program, um, we've only run two so far, it's only been going for a year. Uh, is 12 weeks. Um, obviously, it covers all the stuff that the Officer Foundation program goes into a lot more depth of uh, desistance theory, linking with criminology, uh, family strategies, case management for long-term prisoners. Um, and we're only running two to three courses per year. One is due to start in uh, three weeks' time. We just literally finished the allocations uh, for that, and the next one will be August, and then one in January. The key change these days is um, everybody who wants to be a residential officer has to go through the same assessment process and they get assigned on the same merit order based on uh, their scores through the assessment. So internal and external candidates are assessed and treated exactly the same and then the job offers uh, on the places on the training programs are offered in merit order in accordance with civil service recruitment guidance. So there is no longer any difference between uh, internal or external candidates uh, who want to become a residential officer. So what do you want from the job? Uh, the, the key for me uh, within the Scottish Prison Service is the opportunities it, it avails. You can go from being an ops officer to the chief exec. You can go into training and development. You can go into programs delivery where you're delivering um, behavioral change programs. You can go into policy, you can go into finance, HR, uh, come to the college. Um, so for me, what one of the best things about the Scottish Prison Service is the internal opportunities. All the time there's internal um, development opportunities for 12 months going to headquarters to look at policy um, and things like that. So particularly the women's strategy at the moment, the development of the women's strategy, they have been people from all levels um, up to senior management involved in de designing how we deal with that and what that looks like moving forward. So there's always stuff to learn. We send um, people on master's degrees, we sponsor people through university. Um, so for me, the opportunities for development are, are absolutely um, immense compared to what we're offered in the private sector. Uh, there's also the job security. I've certainly uh, been reflecting on the security of a uh, public sector salary and wage job security during this and sick pay and all the rest of the stuff that comes with um, working for uh, the public sector in these strange and challenging times over the last 12 months and the pension etc so uh, whilst immediate salaries may not compete directly uh, with the private sector certainly the other benefits of public sector employment uh, are certainly something to be considered. Unfortunately, that I had a video um, with the views of some of our current staff, but the, the sound doesn't play on this, so I'm just going to whiz over that. Where are we going? The uh, SPS, a couple of main, and uh, Anna will talk about this a bit more later or answer your questions, is changes in um, the women's estate and uh, young offenders. Um, it has been widely acknowledged that uh, female uh, offenders and young offenders are very different in nature and need um, being different, very different care to the general adult male population within um, the prison environment. As such, we've changed the whole ethos of the Scottish Prison Service has changed. Um, we liaise very closely with academics and the Criminal Justice Society to develop training and our strategy um, 
to move these elements forward. So that's two very major key pieces of work um, that Anna is currently involved in. Um, I'll answer any questions about that. And on, as I've already talked about, on the estate side, the building of new prisons dependent on government uh, capital expenditure allowances. So building of new, a uh, replacement of HMP Barlini and HMP Inverness with new jails. So they're, they're the key bits where the, the prison service is moving forward. Um, the women's estate, uh, those of you will know, um, we do have females in several jails, but we're building a new national facility, brand new facility at Quantum Vale in Stirling. But there's also two new community custody units. They're two small units that are effectively open prisons um, within the community, a very different approach to managing prisoners. Uh, and one is, will be in Dundee and one will be in Mary Hill in Glasgow. And they're due to open probably May, June 2022. Um, so any questions on that, uh, Anna will be able to answer. So prison officers or people who work for the Scottish prison all look very different. Um, there are so many different roles and possibilities. Different skill sets require different skill sets we recruit for. But the fundamental shift over the last 18 months to two years is that we're looking for people whose values align, who want to make a positive impact on the lives of the people that are in our care at all levels. Uh, every job, every task we do uh, should be aligned to the difference that it makes to the individuals in all our establishments across the country. And if that's not where you want to make an impact, then the Scottish Prison Service is not really um, the place for you. So that is, I know that was a really quick and I hate talking non-stop to a blank screen, but I think that's enough. And then open up to, what I'll do is I'll hand over to um, Sam initially, if Sam's still about, um, and Sam will give you a, a background to how she's ended up as a, as a senior manager who is responsible for um, all of the stuff that I'm talking about as head of workforce development, uh, to give you an idea of the alternative career paths that you can take and certainly the opportunities I think the organization is very good at giving. Sam. Okay, um, hello everyone. Um, so just to give a bit of background, um, uh, I'm currently, as Graham said, a head of workforce development at the college. Um, I've been doing this job about 12 months now at the college, um, but to take it back to when I actually first started, I started in the SPS um, in 2012 um, and I actually joined as an operations officer. So Graham just kind of outlined some of those roles. So I joined as an ops officer uh, at the Pullman team. So I did the whole the, the OFP course and everything and then you then you get allocated an establishment. So I worked at Pullman for approximately 18, 18 months to two years. Um, and my intention originally um, was I was doing my master's um, and did my forensic psychology master's. So I'd switched from um, day shift, so it was like a shift pattern, like roster pattern, and went to night shift so that I could study in the day at the university and then work during the night, but also gave me great exposure to working in the, the, that sort of criminal justice sector in terms of um, working with prison populations um, and obviously different colleagues who, who completed different roles within that kind of um, establishment structure. Um, it was when I completed my, I passed my master's, actually the opportunity came up for a training manager position. It was something that previously been won before my time when I joined SPS. Um, and so this was kind of something new and I actually wasn't sure it would be for me, but I, I gave it a go um, and, man, it, and it was about a six month process um, with various different bits. So you'd have like an assessment day where you would go and do a role play and presentations and, and different elements like that. And then if you're successful, you kind of just progress and, and did it. It was like two interviews, um, different bits like that. So thankfully I was successful at that. So I, that then meant that I was um, a operational manager, operational senior manager. Um, but actually within that role, you can do so many different different roles and, and, and functions within within that sort of band of an operational manager, so to speak. So when I, when I was on the training manager position, you were given a, up to a two year um, sort of time frame to get familiar and, and, and basically pass that that course, so to speak. So um, I worked in, I started obviously, like I said, in Pullman, but I worked in Cotton Vale, Edinburgh, Perth, um, and then 
I got signed off in Perth and my first um, official role as a, a unit manager was in uh, Greenock and I was head of residential. So previously I'd worked in the offender outcomes, which is basically looking at sort of the external services that prison, the prison population have to engage with um, sort of um, any support services um, while they work, while they're in, um, in our care, they can ha have jobs. So there's the work parties and different things like that. So that's, that's one area that you can work as, as a unit manager. You can also work in the operations function. So previously where I'd been an operations officer, I was then sort of managing that function. So I pre um, after being head of residential at Greenock, I then moved to head of operations. So um, it's just a say, similar job, but just more responsibility as you go up in, in terms of um, the team size and, and the jobs that you're doing. Um, you also can work it as, as I was as head of residential. So basically that means that I was responsible for all prison populations within the establishment. So um, for example, within Greenock, I managed the female population, a short term male population remand, but also one of two national top ends. Um, and national top ends are basically part of the progression stage for a, a life sentenced or long term um, sentenced individual and um, also some OLRs um, order of lifelong restriction individuals are also like um, cared for in those um, national top ends so this was a huge learning curve for me but I have to say one of the most interesting um, that I've ever worked in um, because you get involved in like the parole the probation um, and and some you have to take part in the risk management team meetings um, and these are huge responsibilities they're obviously you do it in conjunction with psychology and external agencies but it's really it's a really critical bit that you can get involved in so once I was in Greenock um, another opportunity came um, sort of arose with the women's strategy team so I was moved from Greenock to the women's strategy team and I was uh, given the role of operational advisor so at first I was a bit like wasn't entirely sure what this meant because I'd never never been part of building a new prison or, or developing an operating model for a new prison um, so that was basically my work now so I had to I, I did lots of community events to kind of work with the communities in Mary Hill and Dundee um, and sort of developed operating models looked at um, sort of staff and complements and 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 worked with the um, architects team to sort of develop the structural buildings of the two CCU units and the women's national facility um, I was there for a, a, about two two years and then I then got promoted. I went for a promotion board. So um, Graham's kind of outlined some of the promotion routes. So the next one for me was to become a, 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 once again a senior manager, um, operational manager. So it basically is a similar job of what you can do in establishments, but it's once again that ne next level of responsibility. Um, and with that comes other opportunities for you to do across the estate, whether it be at headquarters or across the different sites um, in terms of establishments. So once successful, I was assigned the post of um, head of workforce development. Um, but even if I didn't go for any other promotion, um, within this remit of the of a senior operational manager, I could actually go to something what we call a senior assignment panel. Um, and they they could align me to any other different role. But also if there was an opportunity that came up, say, for example, what Graham's mentioned in terms of policy or um, any strategic work at headquarters that was aligning to my sort of grade, then I could um, apply for those as well. So the, the opportunities are really endless in, in terms of what what you can do. And they vary greatly. Um, like I said, I started um, as uh, an ops officer with the intention of becoming a trainee psychologist in the SPS service. Um, but it's never actually appealed for me to go back now because actually the, the work that I've been involved in, um, I enjoy that much and I get so much, uh, I'm able to contribute so much to a, a different level um, that actually I've really enjoyed I, and I do enjoy the work that I'm doing. So um, I would really echo what Graham said in terms of the opportunities, like from one role to another, it, my roles have really varied. Um, it's a very, obviously I, I won't bore you with all the details of, of what this actually looks like, but it really is different like every day. So the one the one job I was doing and I was um, responsible for releasing people on home detention care, uh, curfews, so that's like the tag. Um, and then the, the next minute I'm um, now working on the development and rollout of training for the control and restraint uh, and the new use of force policy and manual for, for the whole of the SPS. Um, so total extremes of what you can be working on um, and also different teams. So I work really closely with Anna and there's um, kind of a wider team that I work with at the college, um, all kind of have our own remit and, and sort of specialise in different areas of that. Um, 
but it's a great, great opportunity for you to get involved with um, an area that you're not familiar with and kind of get that sort of self-development and, and kind of start venturing out into a new opportunity. Um, so there's definitely um, opportunities if, if you if, if you're interested in trying to, to do something different. And that's what really appeals to me with the SPS. Like I said, I've moved around a lot. So I've been um, Coleman, Edinburgh, Greenock, um, back to Cotton Vale on projects and different things like that. But um, I... Uh, I've never really stayed two years max probably for me um, since 2012. I do move around quite a lot, but I actually really enjoy that aspect of the work. Um, um, but then alternatively, there are opportunities for you to stay in a function much longer. So I think that's why it does appeal to so many people. Sorry, I was just having a note. There's a question there. I wasn't sure if it's to me, but I can pick that up at the end if it is to me. Sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's kind of mine. Um, Graham, I don't know if I've covered everything that, uh, without going into too many specific details, but hopefully that's that's enough. Well, um, I think that's great, Sam. That's, uh, yours is a perfect example of the variety of job opportunities and promotion opportunities within a relatively short period of time. Um, it's not like you've been in for 20 or 30 years, so you've, you've maximised the opportunities. Cool. Anna, you're totally different, um, but equally interesting story. So Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, that just uh, that froze just as I unmuted myself. Apologies. OK, so um, as Graham said, I've had um, a, a very different sort of career in coming into the Scottish Prison Service. I have only worked for SPS for nearly, well, about a year and a half, nearly two years now. And I am non-operational, which means I've never worked as a, an officer on either grade. Um, my career path basically was um, from teaching. I was an FE lecturer for 10 years and the first six years of my lecturing uh, job were, uh, were as a prison-based teacher. And I worked in a few prisons around the central belt, but spent five of those years at Lomos Prison, which you actually saw at the beginning of the slides, um, which is just outside Glasgow. And I thoroughly enjoyed that job. It was a, an amazing job. And I really, really enjoyed building the relationships with the students that I had. During that time, I was also studying for my master's in, um, in education, which actually looked at um, prison education and assistance for women who were in custody and for all of you criminal justice students you'll understand what I'm talking about when I mentioned assistance. After that I went on to study for my PhD at the SCCJR at Glasgow Uni and that took me a few more years than my master's and I, I continued to work in prison education and then laterally decided that I wanted some external experience and moved into working in FE lecturing in, a, in South Lanarkshire College in East Kilbride for a couple of years. So just as I was finishing my PhD, I started to start, start looking around for jobs. It was never my intention to stay in academia, which I know sounds a bit strange, but having worked in prison, I really wanted to essentially work for frontline for SPS, Police Scotland, Scottish Government, criminal justice organisations. So I started looking in that area to see what what was what was out there. And if by uh, as if by I think sheer luck more than anything else and great timing, the prison service had created these jobs called Steam Leads. And there were six of us, and there were brand new posts that were designed by um, the college. And basically. As Graham's already touched upon, what we're trying to do in a lot of external appointees is bring in different experience from a variety of fields. Now, the majority of us that were brought in as team leads come from varied academic backgrounds. And that was really so that we could bring more of a research basis into a lot of the L&D strategies that we are developing. We do have a research team anyway. We have a, a small research team at headquarters and we have a researcher base in the college but they wanted to bring us in to work, not just on research, but on, as I say, on more strategy. So um, I was luckily enough after going through that long uh, recruitment process, which is, is fine actually in the end, but um, to be given one of the posts. And what I've worked on from the beginning, again, as Graham touched on, is I basically have sort of a portfolio of project-based work. And 
my main project is the new women's estate and that is obviously the new women's facility the the two ccus but also encapsulating this the staff training for the staff that work in say the the women's hall in edinburgh and in greenock and things like that so i'm the head l and d person for the women's strategy i'm also the head l and d for the youth justice strategy which predominantly um obviously works with Bowman, which is right beside our building. And the other main strategy that I'm working on is bringing in trauma-informed practice and training into SPS. And I actually noticed that the, the person who asked the question has touched upon the National Trauma Responsive Framework. So not I don't know if I can answer it from a, a recruitment point of view. What I will say is that we are very much sort of at the early stages of becoming a, a trauma-informed workforce, as, as I know a lot of other justice sector agencies are. I know Police Scotland are quite early stages as well. However, the intention is that it will, it will penetrate the entirety of the organisation, including things like recruitment processes. So my day-to-day -day work is extremely interesting and very very varied i have a small team most uh, all of whom are based in different establishments so i work with the senior management at those establishments to ensure that they are being all of their training needs are being met and all of these establishments have slightly different populations so i need to go and do desk research and COVID aside, sometimes some frontline research to find out what staff needs are, speak to people in our care to understand what their needs are. Obviously, um, some of my PhD research was about, again, about prison education and assistance. So I was given the opportunity to do life narrative research with quite a large group of people. And that meant that I learned much, much more about the narratives of people who are in our care and conversely, what can be done to support people when they happen to be staying with us and support them to reintegrate back into the community and not come back to prison because that's the goal. So um, I also work with uh, senior management at headquarters. I work with third sector organisations, other criminal justice organisations. Scottish Government, Police Scotland. Um, so it really, it depends on the strategy and it depends on what stage of the strategy you're at. But generally you spend a lot of time sort of making links with people so that you can deliver as joined up approach as possible. So a lot of what we're working on now is specialised training. And we're, as, as Graeme said, we're specialising a lot of the training for the officer role, but we're also specialising training for staff who are working with particular populations, i.e. women, young people, the elderly, things like that. So I think that's really sort of a, a very, very general overview of my work. I do still get to do a little bit of research. Sometimes I don't have as much time as I would like to do it, but I am still keeping my hand in there, which is great because there's very few jobs other than just being solely research based where you can still get to do that. So what I would say is that if you're listening to this and thinking, well, you know, I really want to work in criminal justice. I don't necessarily want to go down the officer route and maybe don't think it's for me and it's not for everyone. There are so many ways to come into our organisation and that's only going to get um, more varied as SPS changes really over the years from being quite an insular to an outward looking organisation and I know Police Scotland are going through a similar transition. So I would say just, you know, bear us in mind and, and have a look at all the diverse job roles that come up. Um, when we advertise externally and yeah feel feel free I'm sure to get in touch with any of us if you wanted to have a little get a little bit more advice or a little bit more context but hopefully that's given you a little bit of an overview of uh, a, a different way of coming into the organization. Brilliant thanks Anna I will come back and ask answer that question that's on the screen in a minute because um, <clears throat> that is one of the areas of responsibility that my team undertake but uh, as you've heard from Sam and Anna, there's two very different ways of coming in, um, working operationally or non-operationally and the opportunities that are there. <clears throat> My own story, um, I was in the military for 22 years as military aircrew um, and ended up as an instructor teaching other aircrew. Um, I left and I wanted to get into training and development. I actually started trying to be a primary school teacher and decided it wasn't for me. Uh, so I went and, and I I was looking for a permanent job and it just happened to turn up at the Scottish Prison Service College teaching leadership and management uh, and I thought teaching um, prison officers was similar to primary school children so I applied for the job. 
uh, not really intending to stay. Uh, and for, so I initially started teaching their management program, uh, ILM qualifications, ended up getting heavily involved in the transition to the values-based recruitment, training assessors um, to make sure our assessment process was standard and have since migrated across to running um, the small team that is responsible for all the ops and res recruitment. So again, it, it's just the opportunities and the, the variety uh, and having known nothing about the criminal justice system when I arrived, uh, I now sit on um, children's panel as a volunteer because of what I've learned and all the other stuff that uh, I've learned and has gone hand in hand has certainly changed the way that um, I conduct my life outside of work as well. Um, so that's us. I had three very different stories. So if anybody wants to start have any messages if you stick them in there or I don't know if you can put your hand up on this thing but the one question that has been put in is uh, about having close re relations who are uh, I wouldn't say use the term career criminals but that are in custody uh, and the answer is it's not prohibitive um, when if you're successful and get through the process there are some things that are prohibitive um, so criminal some criminal convictions uh, don't expire although um, will prohibit you from becoming a, a prison officer. Uh, but what we do if you are successful is we ask uh, if you have any friends or relatives that are currently or you have been in custody. And if you're honest with us and tell us up front, um, that's fine. What it might do is it might preclude which particular establishment you would then go and work in. Um, but what we certainly do is then we check all our databases for visits. If we find out that you have visitors or you've got relatives in in our custody that you haven't told us about, uh, then that is an exclusion because it goes against our integrity, openness and honesty. Um, and the, a lot of the reasons behind this, uh, again, from my military background, is when we used to do security vetting uh, at a higher level, is if you're honest and you're open and people know about it, you can't be coerced and blackmailed. Uh, a lot of the reasons that people, um, if you hide it, is leaving you vulnerable to coercion uh, and blackmail from serious organized crime and lots of other people. But if you're open and honest and everybody knows about it, that um, that power, that sort of coercive element disappears. So we do ask for that, but it is certainly not um, a, a, an outright prevention of being able to come and work for the Scottish Prison Service. And in my own mind, I actually think for our diversity and for the inclusion, um, the more we can recruit staff, operational staff who have got experience of the environments that a lot of the people in our care come from because it's, you know, there's a vast majority come from a very small number of postcodes and have an understanding of that, then that will improve what we're trying to do whilst minimizing the risk. Um, so that's the balance as a recruitment team we have to strike. So I hope that answers Lee's question. Jane, would voluntary work experience the CJ system be beneficial to an individual's application? Uh, the only way it would be beneficial uh, is it's not taken into account, but when we ask for examples of how you've had a positive influence or what and why you've done it, then the examples that you would bring from um, your experience would help you to demonstrate the values and the competencies that we're looking for. So, and it's right, no, but it's what you do with it. It's like everything. What have you done with that? What impact have you had? What have you learned? Uh, how has it informed what you do uh, in your day-to-day -day life and how have you been able to positively influence and, and challenge individuals and linking that directly if you think as a residential officer to be able to positively influence and also effectively challenge inappropriate behavior of the people that are in custody um, as positive role models and to make that difference. So yes, it would help only because you get good examples. Uh, next question, MSc in psychology, looking at criminal psychologists. Any for further information this role? Um, yes, on our website. And if not, you can, uh, if it's specific about psychology, if you email to the uh, vacancies website, they'll forward it on to the uh, specific person who runs psychology. So it's not a specialist area of the recruitment team, but they can uh, certainly forward it on. I can sort of... I, I expand on that as well because I've worked Jenny, yeah. in the head of psychology. I do know that over the past couple of years they have brought in essentially traineeships 
for forensic psychologists uh, in SPS. And I, I think, as far as I know from what um, the head of psychology was saying, that there's the intention to continue to do that over the years. So it's certainly an area to keep an eye on. They do get posted externally. So you, um, you know, something like an MSc psychology conversion would be enough to apply. And then you would go through your traineeship with SPS. Okay, thank you. Uh, question, do you get any say about the location in which you would be working? Yes, you do, um, but it's a numbers game. Uh, so at the moment there are certain um, number of vacancies at each uh, particular establishment. You put the, your preferences and we would expect uh, an external candidate to accept an offer uh, to an establishment within 25 miles of their working Home. They'll get offered them further away, um, but if you don't accept one within 25 miles, uh, then um, whilst you'd still remain, uh, continue to offer, you go down the priority list. So that's the assignment principles we work on. Uh, and we're always looking for people in Peterhead. So if anybody wants to go and move to Peterhead, uh, <clears throat> we're always uh, looking for people who are wanting to work up there. Next question, would I say having a degree when entering the prison service an advantage when it comes to getting a better job or climbing the career ladder? Sam, you can answer that one. Um, so I actually had my undergraduate when I joined the service, but it wasn't actually something that was required. Um, but I joined as an operations officer. Um, I believe the trainee manager um, for those external candidates, um, there was a requirement for an undergraduate degree agree I think Graham has, um, maybe correct me if I'm wrong but there wasn't um, an expectation that there would be some sort of element of a university study um from a from a personal point of view I completed my master's obviously as I'd already said in the intention to intention to maybe do a different psychology related role but I feel that the, um, me having a master's it, it definitely helped me um not just because it was something I could put on paper but actually what I learned from it so my the way I wrote that my written skills um and just the experience of, of being able to do research or working with different um, groups and things, I found that that was beneficial. Um, so I think, once again, what Graham said, hey, it's how you apply that information. Uh, there are particular jobs in the service that will require you to have a degree um, of some sort. So, um, for example, I know there's apprenticeships um, that they require a different level of um, sort of qualifications. Um, and I think the trainee manager, there was an expectation of a, a, a university degree. Okay, um, but as, as I said, the, the promotion criteria is generally about values, leadership. So the only reason that a degree would benefit you is if actually it's developed your own skill set and your learning and you can apply that and demonstrate that in the workplace to making a positive impact, then that would help you um, in all promotion assessments. Are there any opportunities to volunteer or gain work experience within the SPS itself? Not with us, um, but with our partner agencies. So all the likes of Bernardo's and all the places that use visitor centers and the child stuff. Uh, uh, there's lots of other third sector organizations that work within the, the SPS. So that's where you would get um, opportunities to volunteer or work. We don't specifically within the SPS unless Sam or Anna have any other information on that. But there's a lot of partner agencies we work with to come in. Sorry, I'll, just to expand on that, I actually, um, so when I was teaching in prison, um, it's uh, an FE provider, it's not the SPS that provide the education provision. I came into that role on my student teaching postgrad placement. So, um, and then they eventually offered me a job out of it. So if anyone is thinking about going into teaching in, in the criminal justice sector, then um, I know that they absolutely, um, you can come in in that route and get a little bit of experience. I do know um, that we are now, I don't think it's with UWS, but we are going to be getting at the college um, a, a very small number of research, well, research students, essentially, who I think are either at master's or PhD level, who are coming in to do, I think it's like two or three months work with us. And, and, and other people have done that in the past. One of my colleagues, Griff, he did um, that when he was still undertaking his research. So there's, um, there's also opportunities like that if you're going uh, down that path. <coughs> I, however, don't know where to advertise to at the moment. So sorry, I can't give you any more information on that because it's something new that we're just sort of in the planning stages of. Um, just to, to add from my, my perspective, when I was um, an ops officer at Pullman, when I was doing my master's, my um, dissertation was on um, uh, 
involved interviewing uh, the population at Polvin, um, a handful of females and a handful of males. Um, but during that time, I actually um, worked closely and volunteered in the, to, to an extent in the psychology department. So although I was an operations officer, um, it kind of gave me a great opportunity to make connections whilst I was there and actually worked uh, quite closely with the head of psychology there um, and was able to su support some work from sort of an operational perspective, but also in a great opportunity for me to learn in terms of the, the learning that I was doing for for my master's so um although it's not quite volunteer because I was within the SPS it was um an element of it I guess um once you're in there that you can kind of venture out thanks um next question where are we at uh is there a legal sector in the SPS that takes graduates we don't have a specific legal sector we uh we use a, a legal firm to get our formal legal advice that's outsourced um the sort of legal aspects of within are, are policy driven and they tend to come from either policy specialists across the public sector or from senior managers who uh, learn and, and take on policy roles so very few of our jobs have specific um, graduate requirements obviously quantity surveyors have to have the right qualifications and uh, the psychologists have to come with the, the right forensic psychology degrees but um, the majority of our roles are not specific degree requirements Next one about um, <clears throat> different degrees. Uh, certainly, we weren't considered for any of the, uh, any of the roles uh, out with specific psychology. Yes, and is there a list of partner agencies we could access? Not to hand, but uh, I'll see if I can I can find something like that and I can forward it to Jennifer at some point. And and again, the the trouble with that is each jail has their own partnership working. So um, certainly the colleges uh, and the uh, different third party agencies. So for example, Paulmont works with uh, a lot of the youth third party agencies, etc. So your best bet is <clears throat> possibly to even approach the establishment itself, um, the one nearest to you and, and ask what part agencies there are. Um, but I will have a look and see if I can gather any information on that. And if I can, I'll let Jennifer have it in the future. Although it'll be a couple of weeks because I'm going on holiday. Not going anywhere nice, but <laughs> other, other than my garden. But there we go. Um, that's about it. That's been an hour. Anyone got any last questions? Graham, just one one thing that I would I would just ask yeah. actually. I think our students are you know very used to the sort of competency based interviewing. Um, Techniques. Yeah. Um, so it's really interesting to hear about the value-based um, technique. Is there anything that you would say that would help them prepare for this, or is it really just kind of going in and being honest? And it's about going in and being honest and getting the person it, it turned around that the same competencies. The way you would prepare for a competency-based interview, but having in the old star model uh, of competency-based, the the bit we dig really into how you did it and why. Uh, why was it important to you? So why did you, a lot of the questions are, why did you go above and beyond? Why did you go the extra mile? Why was it important to you? Um, why did it matter? Uh, why helping? And, and the resilience bit of um, how did you overcome the challenges? The, the examples of not just how you did it, but if it was difficult, why did you stick with it? Uh, and what kept you going? Because those, those are the key skills and attributes we need uh, of our, our staff um, because unlocking potential transforming lives doesn't happen overnight. There's one step forward, seven steps back, and it's that understanding of the small wins and the perseverance and stuff that goes on and the, the requirement to keep trying um, that's really important. So it's those sort of drivers that we're looking for to align with what the organization is trying to achieve. So. It, you can't really prepare if you've either got them or you haven't, I guess. But one of the arts in the um, in the interviews one of, is actually really being honest, explaining that, why it's important. Why did you do it? What, what drove you to keep going? Those are the key bits that that really give us what we're looking for, getting to know people. And again, in the group assessments and stuff, be yourself. Don't try and be anyone else. You know, it is about actively think about what we require officers to do with uh, people in our care day in day out it's listening understanding demonstrating that empathy yet being firm role modeling all that sort of stuff that's what we're looking for uh, and our exercise and interviews are set up to um, allow you to evidence that if 
if you've got those that skill set. Thank you. Um, well, conscious of time, um, we've, we've had lots of questions, so thank you, everyone. Um, but I, I just want to say a big thank you to, to Graham, um, Sam, and Anna. Um, I think it's been absolutely fascinating this afternoon and really interesting to hear about the sort of skills that you're looking for and to get that, that insight into your recruitment process. It's, it's really, really helpful and valuable, I think, for, for our students and, and just to understand about, about the organisation um, and some of the changes that, that you've been through um, and, and the diversity of different roles. Um, so, so thank you very much um, and we'll certainly be, be sharing the session um, with, um, with, with more students as well. Um, so yeah, thank you to everybody for today. Um, just a reminder, I'm just going to very quickly um, share a slide that I've got. Um, so just very quickly to remind everyone that we, the career service are continuing to run um, our series of um, virtual events, which includes the um, online industry insights sessions. Um, we've got we've got more of these um, at the moment. They're running all the way into June. Um, obviously, there's the opportunity to book one to one careers appointments with our advisors. So if you do have interviews or applications coming up that you want particular support with, um, that's that's still available online. Um, and there's a host of resources on our website as well. Um, so thank you everybody for today. Um, and, and that ends the session. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.